Cool. All right. Uh, I guess I'm pretty much one of the last sessions of the day. Uh, I, we have one more session here and then closing ceremonies, so we're wrapping up the day. Everybody's crashing from their carbs at lunch and barbecue, so sleepiness, it's nap 30 for sure. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Patrick Coble. Uh, I'm an EUC security architect and uh, do a lot of stuff, and we're going to go over Hack and VDI. This is pretty much like an hour-long presentation. Uh, we're going to squish it down to 30 minutes and uh, just let it ride. So first question is, uh, you know, usually I do this for a couple different audiences. It's the InfoSec professional of how to literally get into VDI deployments as part of adding that to your penetration test portfolio. And then clients, VMware and Citrix, how to secure that deployment. So do we have Citrix clients or VMware clients in here? People that have VDI deployments, your corporate client? A couple, and a lot of you probably InfoSec professionals doing scans, having fun, penetration tests, super cool. First thing for me, it's my daughter's birthday today. So definitely, happy birthday, Catherine. You're out there on the internets. Uh, and uh, I love you, and I'll see you in a little bit. So here's kind of what we're going to go over. Um, basically, some of the fundamentals of what you can do, uh, how to defend it, how to do uh, a lot of different things. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. So my motivation was back in 2015 at DerbyCon, uh, there was a presentation that went over the electrical grid and how susceptible it was to basic attacks with just a cassette tape, right? How you could take down a whole subgrid and substation uh, and do lots of very interesting things with very low-tech dog leashes and stuff like that, right? You did not have to do anything advanced. And obviously, in the electrical industry, there's lots of universal keys. So if you have a couple sets of these keys, you can go into substations and you can do whatever you want to do in there. So that was my motivation. Back then, I did a presentation at DerbyCon last year, uh, September last year, on my birthday too. So it's like both birthday presentations. It's just how the cookie crumbles, I guess. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, main thing for me on the Citrix side is I'm a CTP, which means there's 50 of us in the world. And my focus is Citrix and security, uh, but also do a lot of VMware. And you can read a lot of that. 2016, uh, keynote speaker, very awesome. That was me in 2016. Ripped the Band-Aid off, didn't have a job lined up, two kids, just going to see if I can make it work. And it's worked, right? So why do most people care about VDI deployments? Over 90% of Fortune 1000 companies have a VDI deployment. Zen App, Zen Desktop, VMware View, Horizon, whatever you want to call it. So it's very pervasive in the large clients. If you're doing a lot of small, medium business, you might not run into Citrix, but there's a good chance if you're doing work for large customers, they're going to have it. And there's specific ways that you can exploit it and go into that. Basically, VDI is kind of like the jargon of cloud. It means that you're logging into an operating system, a virtual desktop infrastructure. You're log logging into a desktop or an application, and you're able to run it from anywhere in the world, right? Whether that's Citrix, VMware, WorkSpot, Microsoft RDP, just pure. It's remote execution. That's its number one goal. So. Big two players are Citrix and VMware. They've been around for a long time. They both do it similarly. Um, there's definitely nuances. One is a little more secure than the others. Uh, one day I'll have that talk. Uh, but basically, every one of them has an endpoint that you're working from, some front-end web service, a broker, some virtual app server with an agent on it, and some imaging method. So Citrix, it's basically those are the names of the components. We can go over it. but. Trying to keep this small. VMware, the exact same thing, right? Uh, it's the same building blocks, the same components that make either one work, right? You gotta have an operating system, you gotta have a broker in the middle, you gotta have a delivery method. Um, most of these things have the exact same things. Um, these are all the components that actually make it run. So if you were actually writing your report, if you know some of these names, it will help you, right? Because if you know what these roles are and what they do, you can exploit them. Um, pretty pictures of each one, basically kind of a generic one for VMware View, a generic one for Zen Desktop. Uh, these are the kind of port situations that you're dealing with. So if you, if you pop a box in one of these environments and you're just in mapping around, you're going to see some very strange things uh, that do not look like things that you're used to uh, on a regular client system in a normal penetration test. That's because there's lots of JMS ports. Uh, XML ports, lots of things that are non-standard ports. So one thing I do is I add these ports to my NMAP scans so that I don't have to scan all 65,000, right? 
Um, so that's kind of the same thing. If you can see the difference between Citrix and VMware, VMware has dedicated ports for every single service. Citrix uses the same ports for multiple types of communication. So depending on where you're at, pros and cons there. Basically, lots of consoles, lots of consoles, lots of consoles. These are part of some of the things that make it work. Uh, people that are familiar with Citrix know most of these. Uh, lots of pretty pictures and graphs, right? You got to have that, little things that do it. Um, but that's basically where it is. Each one of these components do the same thing. They're just named differently. So this is probably the easiest way to convert. There's a Citrix deployment and there's a VMware deployment. The exact same components doing a similar job in there. So, so what's happened? Obviously, since 2008, when VDI was really released, Citrix is over 25 years old. People have been doing RDP for more than 25 years. Um, it's very common practice. So after that, virtual desktops became the craze, and we got into where we're at. And so one of the problems that we have is, even if this is a centralized desktop, in some cases it's actually patched less often than your endpoint PCs. And it's because WSUS, your SCCM servers, your Windows updates, how you're doing it, you can't do it on those. Um, because in most cases, they're read-only. So you're only going to be able to go so far, so you don't update these. So I've been at lots of places where when I'm doing a penetration test on Citrix, that one, one flaw is 5,000 desktops botted out, command and control, living the dream, right? You can crush a network, denial service, because you didn't apply one patch, right? And it's just because it's, you know, it's the pace of business. The thing you need to know about any virtual desktop deployment is usually the most important application for the business is on that server. The most important data is accessed from that server. So once you are to that server, you are done, right? The next thing is, is we talk about like some of the methods and stuff like that. We'll go into a little bit more. As you know, we're leaky with a chance of records. You know, a couple billion records have been leaked in just the last little bit. Um, the past couple of years, and it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. It's going to be nonstop. So internal threats are the same thing. So what is it? What do I do on a VDI penetration test? Puppy mill vulnerability scans, right? Everyone knows about that that's been in the security business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's unpatched. Cool. We know that. The next thing is probably policies and best practice reviews, looking at that, optimizing the image, turning things off. Um, but internal, most of the scopes for internal penetration tests are pretty fun for me. Someone will say, Cognos is our most important application in the world. Oh, cool. Publish it to me. And then I get domain admin. They said, but I gave you just Cognos. Oh, that was nice. I just went to help about Cognos Internet Explorer, opened up command prompt, opened up PowerShell, downloaded some executables, executed them, ran them, let Bloodhound run, got domain admin, peace out. And all they did was publish something. That they've actually published this to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. External penetration test. Um, in some cases, depending on the scope, I might be fishing to get credential harvesting and then go from there deeper into the dive. Um, and application gray box is my favorite. Uh, it creates the most documentation. Uh, but it's just the funnest because people publish uh, EMR applications, banking applications, and they think that you can't get out of those. Usually your best is file open and help about. Those are the number two ways to jailbreak out of the application they published you. Um, and from there, it's on, right? A lot of these things, um, some of these deployments start off very secure, but then administrators can't patch them. So they don't know how to deny group policies, so they just turn it off, right? So then you you can have a have a great time. Uh, so most common is phishing. Uh, if I'm allowed to do a phishing campaign, it's like guaranteed. It's in the bag, right? Um, basically, I use Set to clone their login page. They come to me. They put in their username, password. I will even be nice enough after they give me my credentials to forward them to the correct website, and they'll go, oh, I just entered my credentials. And then they enter their credentials again, and it works. Good old redirects, right? you got to love that. Safety first. You don't want anyone to know. Um, there's lots of ports. Publicly scanning, if you're like a big Shodan guy, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff if you start looking for some of these TCP ports on the outside world. A lot of these things are not proxied like they should be, and it's just kind of how it is. 
This is exactly how I do a penetration test. Uh, basically, all those things and then write a report. Um, pretty much, um, I guess it's 100% success rate for domain admin. And why that is, is especially in a Zen app deployment, remote desktop deployment, or anything server-based, so once I'm on that one box, it's guaranteed if I can sit there for a little bit, a domain admin's gonna log in. Pass the hash and meet me cats and party on from there, right? So it's, it's very easy to sit there. Um, there's lots of ways, and just like I said, file open uh, or save or help about are the best ways to get out there. Default policies. Almost both of these solutions come with bad default policies. Copy and paste is completely enabled. Drive mapping is enabled. Drive mapping means that once I get a session, I can copy my command, my C2C goodies up there, and uh, I can start running my campaign, right? Because there's also no execution prevention. I can copy and paste Base64 or PowerShell scripts into the session and execute them from there. So some people will disallow command prompt, but they don't disallow PowerShell. So you can take that with what you want. Recon, lots of scans, just like we talked about, set. Um, pretty much, you know, like we talk about, it's the most applica most important application. So a lot of these, um, there are some known vulner vulnerabilities with certain versions, and they all look a little different. So as you go through this, you start capturing this. Um, and as soon as you go to someone's login page, you know exactly what version it is, and you know what you can do or not do. So just a simple HTTP scan. Uh, default passwords, always, right? Uh, it, it, it amazes me sometimes. Uh, in the most crazy huge companies, 150, 250, 300,000 users, millions and millions of dollars, default password. To literally the most important thing, their SAML IDP, their SAML IDM, right? However they're doing it. It's just, it's bad juju. So basically, you know, each one of these, clickety, clickety, clickety. And just like I said, there's lots of random ports. If you're just doing a regular NMAP scan, you're not going to catch it, hardly any of these, right? And so when you're doing some uh, penetration for somebody or yourself, and you know there's a Citrix or VMware deployment, pay attention to these ports, right? You don't want to forget about these um, because you'll, you'll miss a lot of opportunities. Um, and so a lot of Google dorks, uh, they're pretty cool, right? Um, but those are the way, that, that's the easiest way to find lots of Citrix deployments. And uh, I'm happy that a couple of these I've actually submitted to some of the, you know, bug watch stuff and got them fixed. But what's fun is when you do this, you can find all these companies by just typing this in. But then, now I know their domain name, right? That, that really helps. It makes it nice and easy. Um, so a lot of people aren't obfuscating their domain, and in some cases they have multiple domains and they're still not obfuscating it, right? Um, last time I did this for DerbyCon, it was the Headquarters Army Division. Their, their Citrix deployment was on this list. After a couple emails back and forth, it's not on that list anymore, right? Uh, so I did the same Google dork when I was updating this, and we're all good. So there's that Headquarters Army. Um, basically unpatched, uh, lots of fun ways to get into it externally without doing any credential harvesting. Uh, now it's more better. So pivoting, just like we talked about, all the desktops, all the servers are all the same. Whatever exploit you get to work on one's most likely going to work on all. So it makes it pretty quick to move laterally. Um, the only thing that's really hard is actually to be persistent. Some of these desktops, some of these servers are rebooting every day. So you have a node up, and now it disappears at night. So you got to pay attention. Uh, you want to move laterally to some of the management servers, because some of those never get rebooted for months, and most likely they may not be patched either. There's lots of CVEs out there uh, for both solutions, um, and there's even a couple exploits. When you talk about web application firewall, if anyone's doing that, that's basically like spotting that logon page. Now I know if they're using WAF that I can bypass it. Right, and if they're on that version anyway, it's a couple years old, so they should probably run to the hills. Um, so securing it, keeping it patched is the number one problem, uh, the number one thing that anyone can do to prevent these types of attacks. Uh, optimizing the image to turn off services that they don't need um, also makes it faster, so it's good. Uh, antivirus is really tough. Uh, most antiviruses 
uh, will run on it, but it may cause a 10 to 20% user workload decrease. And so in that case, it means you need to buy 10, 20, 30% more servers. That might be a couple hundred thousand to a million dollars more servers just to run antivirus. So lots of deployments still don't have antivirus. Lots of antiviruses don't also play with these solutions very well because they're link clones, they're provisioned. Um, there's lots of things that get messed up in sysprep. Um, replacing default certificates, IPsec, micro-segmentation are a good way. The most important thing to me, uh, especially in the application gray box testing I do, is using AppLocker or whatever AV. You need to prevent execution of programs you don't need. If you're publishing next-gen, what should launch next-gen? If you're publishing Cognos, just Cognos. Don't let anyone execute anything else. Um, you can do it by Windows policies with AppLocker. You can do it with third-party solutions. Um, and things that are coming out from Citrix is a cool thing uh, called Citrix Analytics Services. Basically, what this allows someone to do is if they set it up, when you start your pen test, they're going to see you, uh, and it can automatically block you based on what you're trying to do. So basically, when it sees someone doing something, unusual upload volume, went to a risky website, removed a USB drive, it goes ahead and pulls the connection. It allows them to add multi-factor authentication and lots of other uh, mitigating steps to make it more secure. And it does this all automatically. It's tunable uh, and it looks pretty for executives. You've got lots of cool numbers and, you know, of course everyone likes a pretty graph, right? So basically, the user had never downloaded anything, bada bing, went crazy. Someone's doing some data exfil. And usually in one of these deployments, it's very important data. Uh, NSX, most of you guys already know about this. Uh, desktop A should never talk to desktop B. Um, if that were true in so many deployments that I do assessments on, uh, I would be done after the first desktop. But it's not true. I may be on the exact same server network with the main controller, SQL, their whole back-end Oracle system, EMR, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, so everybody has a hard outside but a squishy center. So this is how you start fixing that with NSX. Um, so a lot of there, this is what I run. Um, there's lots of stuff on here. Uh, as I come out, I've probably got about 15 blogs that are all waiting to come out. And, uh, and I've been slacking as always. But this is what, these are some of the steps that a lot of people do. Um, and I'm coming out with the pen test framework. So basically I'm taking the step from a couple other people in our industry and making a step-by-step -step guide that basically tells you how to do a penetration test for Citrix or VMware um, and also so that you could do a self-assessment so you know what I would look for out there. Um, and that way you can make some changes. These are the things. The biggest one is multi-factor. Uh, if you have multi-factor enabled on the external connection, I've got nothing in most cases, unless I'm going to use some SMS vulnerabilities, depending on if you're even using SMS or if it's duo push. I mean, it really limits the ways you can get in. But usually what I find at a couple clients, which is why I still have a good success rate, depending on the scope, is Outlook Web Access. Application XYZ, does it have multi-factor authentication? So if I can just get one credential from one phishing attack, I can get in there and then just go laterally, right? And then I'll log in internally, and now all of a sudden the multi-factor login prompt disappears. And now I don't need multi-factor authentication. Now I can log in and uh, do all that. So I went way faster than 30 minutes. So are there any questions? I was trying to make sure that I wasn't going to be that guy that was like, hey, uh, yeah, so we're going to have to stay about 10 minutes late. And so that's good. So. Has anybody got any questions or anything like that? Yes, sir. Um, I, you mentioned uh, EMRs uh, for Citrix. Uh, um, the EMR we use is remote hosted. Yep. Um, I mean, and so they, they even exploit that. They're not exploiting that in our system. They're exploiting uh, they're, EMR. Yep. So I've went to a couple places that had Cerner, right, remote hosted, and Epic. So basically they publish... They publish a virtual desktop or Zen app or Zen desktop, whatever, and then that is what they use to launch that remote hosted solution. The problem is, is it sounds like it's probably benign because you can't get to it. Um, but the problem, is, but what it comes down to is I can still exploit your whole domain of your environment. I might not be able to go after Cerner. 
Now, some of those uh, you can go after. So I've done a couple tests with some of the big names of a couple companies uh, and other solutions that they thought were completely secure, and a file open or a help about was their undoing because they never thought someone would actually hit help about and then click a link, and Internet Explorer is open, now Windows Explorer is open, now PowerShell is open, now I'm downloading something, now I'm executing something, right? It's just, it just is, it is what it is. Um, so my cause, my why, is trying to help people secure this stuff, right, and getting it out there. There's lots and lots of clients, lots of companies out there all over the world, and there's lots of things you can do that are very easy. Um, I did a speech last week in Omaha, and the most important key, the one registry key that can slow down anyone pivoting is disabling start menu from run. Taking run away off the start menu means that I, when I'm on Internet Explorer and I type in regedit, even if you've locked it or not locked it, it won't execute because it means run cannot run. So from File Explorer, from Internet Explorer, from the run prompt, you can't type in short commands anymore. And then another thing, a lot of people publish Internet Explorer and Microsoft Office, those are the worst two applications to ever publish because you probably have no command and control what someone's doing inside those. Number one, Outlook, phishing. Someone's going to do it. Anyone's logged in as an administrator, it means they're going to have even more fun, right? Um, and then on the Internet side, you can't control what they go to in most cases. So um, some people will have some content filtering, but with the way you can also take code now, put it into some DNS text records and just read that back over PowerShell, you're still going to be able to execute something. So the, what I recommend to a lot of my big clients that use Internet Explorer for any of these things is just black hole the Internet traffic. So what, what's the simplest way to do that? Proxy configuration to the local host IP. So that means it can't go to the Internet, it can't go to the intranet, it can't go anywhere. All right, so that's a good, easy, cheap way Three or four policies that can make it more better. Yes, sir. So you mentioned issues with AV running in DDI. Yep. Have you seen successful EDR deployments inside of DDI? Yes, very few, but it's still up and coming, right? Um, if we think about it, those solutions are still so young in the industry. A lot of people haven't even done it. Everyone still thinks SEP is the greatest thing in the world. Um, you know, because it's got 12 versions, so it should be legit, right? Um, so there's only a couple of clients that do that. I've got a couple of people with like Carbon Black and Silence, um, a couple of people running like binary defense systems and stuff like that, and other shims and monitors. I got a people using Device Guard and Credential Guard and Windows Defender. Windows Defender does a great job in there, right? And we already had some talks over ATA, right? And then you have ATP. So you can really take it to the next level. Um, but a lot of cases, if you can just prevent execution other than nextgen.exe and word.exe with those those SHA hashes, you're going to be a lot safer than the average bear. Um, so that's probably the main thing is disabling run, black holing your internet traffic if you can. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Uh, then you're going to need to set up a real proxy server that allows them to go to the six websites they should go to. Right, and then that way you can stop it. So I think that's probably getting pretty close to time. We got a yeah, got like a couple minutes, but has anybody got anything else? Well, cool. Thank you guys for coming and staying awake, and uh, y'all have a good one. Thank you. <laughs>